بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه والسنة بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this live uh, a session an episode of Ask Huda broadcasting to you live uh, about 10 minutes or 11 minutes late than scheduled because of the Maghrib prayer so we do apologize uh, until we re uh, receive your um, phone calls, a sister has sent an email, and I hope I don't find difficulties reading the email because I have the wrong glasses on. Um, she says that a husband and wife have been living separately for about five years, and they don't have any intimacy at all due to marital problems. Her husband does not want her, but still hasn't given her a talaq. They are not in contact anymore and the wife now wants to marry someone else this is not permissible at all they're still married their separation a lot of the people think that if a man and wife do not have um, intimacy sexual relationship after three months or six months or a year they would become divorced by default and this is wrong a man can be married to a woman not seeing her and being away from her for 20, 30 years and yet still be married. So in the case of the sister, they, she cannot marry, uh, remarry someone else unless one of three happens. Of course, excluding death. Either the man divorces her or the man accepts to take financial compensation in order for her to take khul'a which is uh, 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 her asking for divorce and buying herself off, or the Islamic or the Muslim judge gives them separation. So if one of the three does not take place, she cannot remarry. Her options are, one, she should call him, try to have her father uh, uh, communicate with him or her guardian or herself and ask him to give her divorce there's no point why would a man not live with his wife for five years and insist on keeping her not giving her divorce he is an oppressor he is zalim Allah Azza wa will punish him because he's neither having a normal marriage with her and he's neither uh, and he's not uh, setting her free and therefore he's sinful and Allah would hold him accountable for that as well and if he doesn't want to give a divorce then she should buy herself off by giving him back uh, his dowry or uh, uh, buying herself out with whatever he wants or uh, demands if both are not permissible she should go to the muslim judge and she should tell him that this man is neither providing for me and he's not living with me and he's not letting me go and the judge would look into her case and if he sees that he is an oppressor and he is a volume then he would he had has uh, 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 the, the power to go and divorce her uh, from him even if he is not willing uh, or accepting okay uh, brother Munib uh, says that he was following a brother in prayer uh, generally speaking his asking about an issue which is that he is praying behind a brother, but this brother is, mashallah, uh, um, the imam is Mr. Ferrari. He prays in a way that it is yani, difficult for those praying behind him to catch up. So he's uh, literally asking, what's the ruling if I, by the time I go to the bowing position, he's already saying, Sami Allah liman hamida. He's not giving us time to recite the Fatiha. He's not giving us time to say Subhan Rabbi Alim three times or, or more or in sujood again. He is moving in a very quick fashion. So what's the ruling on that? 
First of all, either you are too slow or he is too fast. If he is too fast for everyone and he is not praying correctly, then there is a big, big problem. And I believe that your prayer behind him is invalid. In the Sahih, a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and he prayed two rak'ahs at the side of the masjid and came to the Prophet and said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. The Prophet replied the salam and said, go back and pray because you did not pray. So the man went and prayed two rak'ahs and came back and the Prophet said again, Aisam. He prayed for the third time and then the man said, I don't know how to pray. So the Prophet told him that when you pray, in each and every position of prayer, whether you're bowing or raising up your head or uh, prostrating or sitting between the two prostrations, you must have the tranquility. You must have the, uh, 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 the peace in wherever you sit or stand up or do whatever you do. You cannot just go up and down like this quick in a quick fashion because this is not acceptable and your prayer is uh, uh, not valid as the Prophet said therefore if he's too fast then his prayer is invalid and you should pray on your own if you're too slow then this is a problem that you have to fix by reciting a little bit quicker and uh, uh, saying your adhkar of the salah in a, a quicker fashion if neither for one reason or the other if he's medium but you are also medium and he was too quick for you you have to follow up and catch up. This lagging behind uh, uh, momentarily is uh, uh, forgiven, inshallah, but you have to work on your speed uh, again, inshallah. Uh, Brother Abdul from Saudi? Yes, I have a question. Yes, brother. Uh, I want to get married to a pious uh, uh, sister, but my parents are refusing. Okay. So what should I do? Okay. I will uh, uh, answer your question, inshallah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, Brother Abdu has a question which is quite common. He's saying that he wants to marry a woman. She's practicing. She's pious. But her parents are not allowing this. First of all, in a marriage, it is... The father that counts, his approval, his consent, is what counts, not the mother. Usually mothers are emotional and they are difficult to please. So Islam puts all the load and the responsibility on the father of the girl. And, the fa and, the, and, and in Islam, marriage, you have to have the consent of two. The guardian, which is usually the father, and the woman. So if a man proposes... And the father says, okay, you're fine, you're financially fit, and you come from a good family. Daughter, I'd like you to marry this man. And she says, nope, not interested. Khalas, there is no marriage. He cannot force her. He doesn't have the power to force her. And if he does, the marriage itself is uh, uh, void because her consent is essential. Now, if you reverse this and the girl says, wow, he's the man of my dreams, father, and the father says, no, nope, I'm not going to accept this and I'm not going to allow this. Why? Because of reasons one, two, three, or because I just don't want him. In this case, the marriage is not acceptable. So my advice to you is to look for someone else who's more practicing and pious and whose family are willing to give their daughter to you in marriage. Now, if the father has rejected like 10 or 12 proposals previously who were all pious, practicing and fit and there's nothing wrong with them. He simply doesn't want to get his daughter married either because she's working and he's taking her salary or because she works around the house and she uh, cooks for them and takes care of them or for any other reason. If this is the case, the girl should complain to the Muslim judge. She should go to the court and say, this is my case. My father is uh, postponing and delaying my marriage and I'm like 25 years uh, old. What, what do I have left? So um, time is running. 
I'd like the, the, the judge to look into my case. The judge then looks at the one who's proposing, and if he's fit, he talks to the father, and the father is adamant and, and still insisting. The judge overrides his uh, consent, and he marries this girl to that boy. But this happens only when you reach a dead end, and the father is uh, adamant not to get her married, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Atif from Saudi? Yeah, assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, um, Shaykh, I was uh, reading about a ruling regarding uh, burying Muslims and non-Muslims in the same graveyard, okay. and it was mentioned there that it is uh, prohibited. But I'm not able to find uh, the dalil on the basis of which this conclusion was uh, reached. So uh, I would like to have your advice on this, please. Okay. I will try, inshallah, yes, to ask you. Exactly. Aisha from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum. Salam wa rahmatullah. Uh, Sheikh, I have three questions. Inshallah. Uh, first, uh, uh, can a woman travel daily to Jeddah without uh, a mahram? From where? From Delhi to Jeddah. Oh, okay. This, okay. This, this distance. Okay. And second question is, if someone makes an intention that uh, if my so-and-so wish is completed, um, then I will pray and read, uh, read uh, pray uh, Salah and read Tasbih. And, uh, and uh, without uttering it, without, without uttering it, he uh, writes, writes it down. Oh, he, it's been later, written down. Later on, the person is not able to complete this intention. Okay. Uh, then what the person do? Should he give a ransom or not? Okay. Third question. And third question is, uh, if a person pray while traveling in a sitting position, should uh, this person make up the Salah later on in a standing position? Uh, I, I didn't understand this. Uh, if a person pray while traveling okay. in a sitting position. Okay. And he's, he was able to stand? Yes, he was, he was able to stand, but um, he can't. And but, this is this uh, then is for, later for... on he can uh, make make up this uh, salah or not? It's for the salah or voluntary? Yes, for for the salah. Okay, I will answer you. For the salah. Okay, thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Okay, um, Atif says that he knows that the ruling for um, burial that a kafir should not be. A disbeliever should not be buried in a cemetery of the Muslims, and the Muslim should not be buried in a cemetery of the disbelievers. And this is what all scholars agree upon. And he's saying, where is the, uh, this ruling comes from? First of all, it might come from the fact that Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet, ﷺ, when Ali ibn Abi Talib, his son, came to the Prophet and said, your uncle has died, and he's, he died astray meaning that he, wasn't, he did not accept Islam. So the Prophet told him, salam, to take care of him and bury him anywhere. And he did not tell him to bury him in so-and-so -so cemetery where the Muslims are buried. And it has been since Allah knows when that the Muslims are segregated from the non-Muslims in burial. The non-Muslims, it is not for us to wash them, to shroud them, to take care of their body. We only, if they're related to, uh, to us, we have to just take care of them and bury them under the ground. Unlike the Muslims where we take care of them and we wash them and we perfume them and we shroud them in a certain fashion. And then we offer a uh, janaza or funeral prayer and then we take them and bury them in the Muslim cemetery. And this is what all the scholars of Islam, to my knowledge, have uh, agreed upon. Um, Aisha had three questions. Uh, first of all, she's asking, is it permissible for someone to travel from Delhi to Jeddah without a mahram for a female? And the answer is definitely not. Uh, this is not permissible. This is the fatwa of the Prophet, alayhi when he said that it is not permissible for a woman who believes in Allah and the Day of Judgment to travel without a mahram. So she has to have a mahram uh, accompanying her, whether she is from Delhi to Jeddah or even from Cairo to Jeddah, which is a couple of hours, or even from uh, Bahrain to, to Jeddah or, or to the Dammam. 
secondly, she says that a person made a vow, and a lot of the people make vows or they pledge uh, with Allah Azza wa Jal, saying that, Oh Allah, if I pass this exam, I will pray, I will fast, I will give charity, I will slaughter a, a, a sheep and give it in your cause. Um, they say, if you cure my sick son, I will do this and that. And this is not recommended. The Prophet forbade this, and he told us, do not do that. And he gave us the reason, and he said that this is one of the ways that Allah extracts from a, a, a miser, from a stingy person. Because if you didn't have a problem, you would not have vowed to pray or to slaughter or to give in charity. But because you have a problem, this is how Allah takes it uh, uh, off you. Now, it is not recommended, but if you already had done it, then it's mandatory for you to fulfill it. Saying it is a must, but if you just thought of it, this would not count. However, if you wrote it down, this is like saying it, if you intend it. So you must fulfill your vow unless there is a reason for you not to do it. For example, if you fast, uh, if you vow to fast and then you became uh, chronically ill and you are unable to fast at all. In this case, you have to pay the expiation, which is feeding 10 people from the middle of what you eat, which is approximately 1.25 kilogram per person of rice or a meal with a quarter of a chicken or half a chicken with some rice and give it to 10 poor people, each of them. We have Huda from Saudi. We have Huda from Saudi Arabia. Hello, assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, Sheikh, um, I need your advice. I'm a very generous person. Okay. But in the last year, I became critically ill, and still people are asking me to help them. I don't know how to say no. So you don't have how money to help them? This is my question. You do not have money to help them because of your uh, financial status? Yeah, but I will still go out, sell my gold, and, and give whatever I have, I will give. Okay. I don't know how to say no. Okay, I'll answer your question, inshallah. And we have Khadija from Nigeria. Khadija? Wa alaikum as salam. Turn down the volume of your TV and listen to me from the phone, please. Hello? Yes. I have one question. Yes, what's your question? Okay, I have intention of going into makeup, like doing taking uh, makeup as a profession. I don't know if it's allowed in Islam. If it's allowed in Islam to do what? Yeah. Really? Is it allowed to take makeup as a profession? Like, you know, Islam is. In, in Islam, it's not allowed to carve the eyebrow. I don't carve my eyebrow, but I don't know if it's wrong if I carve for someone else. Um, I, I, you're asking about confession? Hello? Are you asking me about the ruling of confession in Islam? No, carving of the eyebrow. Eyebrows, okay, okay. I will answer your question, inshallah. Okay. Uh, Aisha had a third question, and she says that if a person prays sitting down while traveling, can he, once he reaches his destination, repeat these prayers and pray standing up? And I asked her specifically, was he able to stand up while traveling? She said yes. And the answer, no, his prayer is invalid, sitting down, and he is sinful for delaying the prayer until the time was out. So he should have prayed standing up. Praying standing up is a pillar in, in, in prayer. The Prophet told his companion, pray standing up. And if you cannot, pray sitting down. And if you cannot, pray lying on your side. So if you're traveling in an airplane or on a train and you can stand up, you have to pray standing up. And after that, you may uh, bow normally. And if you cannot prostrate because there's no space, then you may bow a little bit uh, uh, lower and you continue your prayer as usual. But if there is no possibility for you to stand up because you are unable to stand up 
where you're sitting because the ceiling is next to you and you can't stand up properly and they will not allow you to stand up in the aisles or near the bathroom or whatever for one reason or the other. In this case, yes, you may pray sitting down. Huda. Okay, we have Ashfaq from Saudi. Ashfaq. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, Ashfaq. How are you, Sheikh? I'm fine, Yaqi. Zakallah khair. I have, well, I need one clarification. Inshallah. I am in Jeddah. Whenever I go to Mecca for Umrah or for just praying, should I pray Sunnah Namaz after Fajr or I should just pray Fajr, I mean, uh, Faras Namaz? And why is this? Why are you asking this question? Because if I go to Umrah and come back uh, in the, on the same day, yes, should I be considered as a traveler? E, okay, I will answer your question and I will clarify it to you, inshallah. Okay. Okay. Um, Huda, she says that she used to help people a lot and now she's unable to do this, whether because she ran out of money, but she has some gold, so... Is she obliged to sell her gold and assets? No. Helping people is a good thing. But this should not come on the account of yourself. So you should not spend all your money and then you start begging people to help you. You have to fear Allah to the best of your ability. You have to help people to the best of your ability, but keeping something that sustains your livelihood and your family and keep you away from... Uh, um, extending your arm and hand, asking people to give you money. And Allah Azza wa Jal would give you uh, more than what you intend. And Allah Azza wa Jal would replace you with much more than you have uh, spent. Uh, Khadija is asking about her eyebrows. She has a problem. And a lot of the women have problem with their eyebrows. And some of them don't have a problem, but... Shaitan comes to them and says, Oh, you look ugly, look how thick they are, people would think you're a man, etc. All women are beautiful. And you don't have to look like a movie star or to look like a, a, um, a supermodel. All what you have to be is yourself. And you are beautiful because Allah created you this way. Now, plucking the eyebrows is totally prohibited. Cutting them is totally prohibited. Shaving them is totally prohibited. So what else do we have if it's a bit thick or there's a hair here or there? You can bleach it. So bleaching it or coloring it so that it would not look like eyebrows, it look like your own uh, skin, this is permissible. Now, if you do not have eyebrows to begin with, this is an abnormality, this is a defect. So it is permissible for you to draw it if for one reason or the other you don't have any eyebrows at all. It's permissible to draw something that looks like an eyebrow. If it's too thick and people really see, say that this is at all abnormal, this is definitely not normal and you're scaring the people in the middle of the day and the children can't go to sleep because they're petrified of, of this, if this is the case and it is the consensus of all you know and everybody says that this is not normal, in this case it might be changed to be normal but not to, the, to be beautified. Um Musa from Dubai. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I want to ask this question um, that my father, um, he has certain issues, he is manipulative about certain issues. I am married and um, now um, he creates problem um, in my marriage uh, when um, he has divorced two wives and I was the only one staying with him. He was physically abusive to me and now he's creating problems in my marriages and he's not a practicing Muslim as well. I wanted to know how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, wants me to deal with him. Okay, I will answer your question inshallah. Jazakallah. Ashfaq is having a misconception. He's saying that he's in Jeddah, he goes to make a Umrah, and usually he goes like 4 a.m., which is before Fajr prayer, and he reaches Al-Haram, and he waits, the Adhan is called, and he's hesitant. 
should I pray the two rak'ahs of Fajr, the Sunnah, or not? And this is a misconception because he says, I am a traveler and travelers don't pray Sunnah. Wrong. This is a misconception. A traveler, first of all, does not pray Sunnah of Dhuhr, Maghrib, and Isha. That is it. So you don't pray four rak'ah before Dhuhr, two rak'ah after Dhuhr, two rak'ah after Maghrib, and two rak'ah after Isha. When you're traveling. But Sunnah al-Fajr and the Witr and the night prayer and Duha prayer and uh, Istikhara and two rak'ahs of Wudu, everything else, the nine, the whole nine yards, you pray them even if you're traveling. Because the Prophet Hassan used to, tra to, to travel and he never ever abandoned or skipped the two rak'ahs of Sunnah al-Fajr. This is misconception one. Misconception two. And I hope misconception get married soon so that we would not have that anymore. The misconception is that people in Jeddah, when they travel to Mecca, we do not consider this to be traveling. So you pray the Sunnah of the Dhuhr and the Maghrib and the Isha because the commuting between Jeddah and Mecca is less than 80 or 90 kilometers. And the people of Mecca and Jeddah do not consider commuting to be traveling. And that is why we have lots of people living in Mecca and working in Jeddah and the opposite. Therefore, you are treated normally. You treat commuting between Mecca and, uh, Mecca and Jeddah normally. You don't shorten the prayer and you pray all your voluntary prayers. Brother Muhammad from Dubai. Yes, assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu rahmatullah. Uh, I have a question regarding the car. Mm -hmm. um, I'm paying the car on my cash, on my gold, on my uh, shares, whatever tangible I have got. What about the uh, um, real estate? Like I have uh, two, three plots of land in my native country, and I have three daughters, and I have bought them with the intention that they will grow, and they will, you know, take those plots and they can either sell they can build houses. It's not for trading purposes. It's just only for, you know, for, for their welfare, basically. So okay. I, I have not been paying the card on those uh, plots. Okay. Can you clarify? I will. This is question one. Mm. Second question is regarding the uh, inheritance. So I have three daughters, no son. Um, how would it be distributed after me? How would my wealth be distributed among these uh, girls? And will it go to my ancestors as well? How old are you? Muhammad, how old are you? Uh, I am 60 years. Okay, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, I will answer your question, inshallah. Uh, um Musa from Dubai, she says that she is married and her father is an abusive person. He divorced two or three wives and she was living with him and he abuses her physically and he uh, manipulates her mentally and he causes problems and now he's causing big problems in her marriage. So she says, how do I do deal with this father? First of all, your responsibility and your priority should be your husband. So if your husband tells you, don't talk to your father, you don't talk to your father. Not literally, but you can call him on the phone. If he tells you, don't go and visit your father, you must uh, uh, obey him. If he tells you, your father does not set foot in my house, you must obey him. Because he has the right and he, ha he has the priority in your uh, uh, list. Your father, being who he is and doing what he does, you should ask Allah for your rights but give him his rights. So you should call him every single day. How are you, father? Check on him. If your husband allows you to send him money or to buy him groceries or to check on him every now and then, you should do that. But don't let him manipulate you. Don't let him abuse you. Uh, and if he does, you may keep your distance a bit away from him. But it is not my way or the highway. It is not 100% no, I'm not going to talk to him. I'm, I'm going to shun him. I'm not going to uh, have anything to do with him. No, this is haram. You have to keep 
some sort of connection between you and him. And whatever wrong he does, he is questioned and he's held accountable on the day of judgment. Now, don't let that affect you because you also will be held accountable on the day of judgment. So you have to connect to him, to be kind and respectful with him. Try your level best to be diplomatic with him so that you would not uh, make him uh, angry or make things that you don't want him uh, to do. We have Brother Muhammad from Saudi. Muhammad from Saudi. Hello. Yes, Muhammad. Yes, yeah, Wa alaikum Sheikh. Wa alaikum Listen, uh, listen Jake, to me from the phone. Uh, I have three questions. Okay. Uh, number one is that the wife has the right to keep her husband uh, husband's earning and know all her husband's financial transactions. Okay. Second and, question. Uh, my second question, uh, Sheikh, uh, that the wife has the right to know when her husband ha uh, husband wants to have second wife and so on. Well, what if the wife disagrees? Should it uh, stop the husband? Okay. And my third question, Sheikh, is uh, when, my uh, when my biological mom died, her uh, younger sister became my stepmom. So my, my uh, question, do the, uh, do the right of my real mom and my maternal aunt also my stepmom the same. Example, when I uh, wanted to marry, my stepmom was against my choice. So it took, it took me uh, years waiting for the approval. Is it uh, correct? What, what was the last approval bit? Yes, sir. What was the last approval bit? Uh, for um, um, uh, to marry, uh, I was um, I was I was and I I want to marry at that time, so I waited for uh, her approval okay. before I get married. Okay, I will answer your question, inshallah. Okay, Muhammad is asking, he's from Dubai, asking about uh, about zakat. He has th two or three plots back home, and he would like to keep these for his daughters when they grow, and he would like to give it to them. So is there any zakat on them? The answer is no. No zakat on your real estate unless they are prepared and made for selling and buying. So if you are dealing in real estate, buying and selling, buying and selling, and making profit out of that, then you have to pay zakat. Or if you're renting it, the rent itself, you, you get the cash. If it stays with you for a whole lunar year, then you have to pay zakat on that. If you spend it, there is no zakat on it. His second question was about his three daughters. And the reason I asked him why I, uh, uh, how old he was, so that if he told me that I'm like 30 or 40 years of age, and I say, Akhi, you still have time. Uh, work hard, maybe Allah would bless you with uh, a male child, but he's 60, so 60 is uh, not usually. There are people, I know people who got married and got uh, children uh, when they were over 60, but maybe this is not the best choice for you at the moment. So he's asking about the inheritance. The inheritance is divided by the Quran. So in your case, your wife gets one-eighth of whatever you leave, and your daughters, they get two-thirds of whatever you leave. And the rest goes to your siblings. Because I, I presume you don't have a father living or a mother. And uh, this goes to your brothers and uh, uh, sisters who would share uh, the rest. And don't think of this. As long as Allah, mashallah, gave you wealth and, and your children are fine. And, and he, yeah. Don't be uh, so stingy and saying, oh, my brothers will get like one out of uh, 20 of my inheritance and this is too much. Why I should write all of my real estate and give my money to them now so that I would deprive my siblings from it. This is not the right way of doing it. And uh, think positive and things would turn to be positive, inshallah. Uh, Brother Muhammad from Saudi. Muhammad from Saudi Arabia. Hello. Yes, Muhammad. Yes, Salaam wa rahmatullah. 
How are you, sir? I'm fine, Zakalakhe, for asking. Yeah, sir, I have one question. Yes. Yeah. Your question? Yeah, Muhammad. Yes. What is your question, Akhi? Yeah, uh, uh, Sheikh, uh, uh, I just want to ask you about the uh, interest, the uh, riba. Okay. Uh, I'm from India, mm. and uh, I have my deposits uh, in India. Yeah, uh, generally we get uh, interest on the deposits, I mean, the uh, saving accounts. Okay. Uh, what will happen uh, generally in India? They do interest on the uh, on the saving accounts also. Okay. Uh, is it permissible? Uh, 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 this interest you know, can be used for the locker rentals or for the property tax rentals. Okay. This interest generally the interest is riba is haram, but can we use this for this purpose because there is a property tax and there is a locker tax. What is the locker so tax? What is the locker tax? The to, this, uh, to pay this tax? What is the locker tax? Uh, the the locker. I mean the the safety deposit locker. Ah, okay, okay. I will answer your question, inshallah. Yes, sir. Hayyak Allah. Muhammad from Saudi Arabia, different than this Muhammad, and we have we had a lot of Muhammads, mashallah. Um, he says that is it permissible for a wife to take control of her husband's earnings and to know how much he makes what is his income and the answer is this is dependent on how you deal with your wife it is up to you whether you tell your wife or not it is up to you whether you give her the money so that she runs the affairs of the house or not i personally don't give uh, my wives my salary or my income and none of my wives know how much i make this is how I feel. Now, do I uh, uh, advise people to do this? No, not necessarily. I know brothers who are very happy, take their uh, salary at the end of the month and give it to their wives, and their wives are wise and reasonable. They control the financing of the house, and they save, and mashallah, they're well off. So it, it, it is not a clear cut with is halal or haram. No, this is something that you communicate with your wife or wives, and you uh, reach an agreement and no one can force you and tell you no either you tell me I'm, or I'm going to file for khul'a yeah. now th th nobody does this and if she does this then definitely she, you're not married to the right uh, uh, person and Allah knows best uh, does she have the right to know whether I'm going to marry a second wife or not it's not a must but you can marry without telling her or informing her you can make this a secret. Now, do I advise this? Definitely not. I've seen so many brothers marrying in secrecy, not telling their wives, except after five or ten years. And it's a breach of trust. She will never trust you after that. And she would rarely show her and express her love to you after that because you have betrayed her. You've stabbed her in the back. Sheikh, if I tell her, to, um, I want to get married, she will ask for divorce. Akhi, this is better than marrying behind her back and then telling, telling her after five or ten years while you're drinking cappuccino in the morning, uh, honey, listen, I, I married another woman and we have like six kids. Uh, sorry. What would you expect her to do? you either going to give her a heart attack or you're going to be stabbed to, to death. So I highly recommend to be transparent. If you have to get married, you have to do it. You tell her, not six years like people do. I know people that they're torturing their wives every single night. I'm going to get married. I'm going to get married. And they've been doing this for six years or five years. Achi, once you want to get married, keep things, keep a lead on it. And once you want to get married, a week or ten days before, tell her, listen, I'm getting married next week. And this might help. Uh, uh, Insha'Allah, and Allah knows best. Khadija from Nigeria. Khadija. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. I called you earlier. I think you did not get my message. Okay. That's why you didn't get my question. What was your question? And, and speak slowly I and clearly. I was I... I Clock, um, clocking someone's eye, eyebrow, not me clocking my, like helping someone to clock 
um, her eyebrows. So you're the one who's plucking the eyebrows? Yes, and the, the okay. second question is if um, taking makeup as a profession is permissible in Islam. Okay. I will answer you. Okay. Uh, uh, Muhammad from Saudi Arabia's last question is that they have a belief that when his mother dies, his step uh, sister or his maternal aunt or his uh, paternal aunt or whatever become his mother. Do they have the right uh, exactly as a mother? And the answer they are not related to your mother at all. They have no rights like or similar to your mother. So sh them became, becoming your mother is baseless, is out of the question. And you don't need or you don't seek the, uh, their approval when you want to get married or want to do anything because they have nothing to do with you except that you respect them, you love them, etc. Muhammad from Saudi Arabia is asking about um, a deposit box or depositing his money in India. And he says that all, all bank accounts, they give interest. So if they were to have, for example, a, a current account that does not give it, uh, interest, it is a must for you to deposit your money there. But if all current deposit, time, uh, 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 timeshare, fixed uh, deposits, uh, whatever, all give you interest, whether you like it or not, in this case, this interest money, you're not entitled, you're not allowed to use it. You have to cleanse your wealth by spending it in means of charity. However, because it is forced upon you, we have other expenditures that are forced upon us that are not legitimate, such as road tax, uh, 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 deposit tax, deposit box tax, or uh, income tax, or whatever taxes the government is taking from you. This is illegal Islamically. So if I don't pay, they're going to put me in jail, or it's going to cause me a, trub a problem. In this case, Islam tells you pay it. Now, if you don't uh, have any other choice but to take the interest, in this case, you may take the interest and give it to your income tax or all uh, kind of taxes without any problem, inshallah. Khadija from Nigeria's question was that she is asking about the ruling on plucking other women's eyebrows. And the Prophet, والسلام, as in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, he gave you the ruling and he says, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may Allah curse the women who pluck eyebrows and who get their eyebrows plucked. So the doer and the one who is it being done to, both are cursed by the Prophet ﷺ. So this is totally prohibited. You cannot assist in any means or forms in such an act. Working as a beautician is permissible, but with restrictions. So if I work only with Muslims, that is Muslim women, and not me, definitely you. A female works with Muslim women in beautifying them and they abide by the hijab. They cover their faces, so whatever work I do, no non-mahram men would look and enjoy. This is permissible, providing I do not pluck eyebrows, I do not make humps on, on the hair, uh, and I do not see or they do not expose their awra uh, uh, to me as a female, as a woman. So beautifying, uh, doing their hair, doing their face, makeup, etc. As long as they're covering this and no um, non-mahram would look at them, this is permissible. But unfortunately, most countries, they come not wearing the Islamic attire. And when you beautify them, they go out and men look at them. This is haram and you should not do that at all. Uh, we have a question from Bats Spider-Man. And uh, by the name, uh, yani maybe this is uh, uh, influenced by comic books and, and movies. So he says that in Friday prayer, in short, it, I am squeezed in a, in a row because there is no much space to the extent that I may st yani stand a little bit tilted. And not only that, when the imam prostrates and everybody prostrates, I find it impossible to squeeze myself in them because of their elbows. 
So I end up waiting until the imam sits and they sit so that I can prostrate. Akhi, this is not permissible. As long as you are in the row, you can squeeze yourself. So gently push their uh, elbows away and squeeze yourself inside. Or better more, the minute the imam falls to prostration, you be the first one to fall uh, behind him so that they would not be there before you are and you must uh, uh, prostrate normally and, and do your best. Ruhana says, is it allowed to eat food given by organization like Lions Club? And if, the, uh, if this organization is a part of the Freemason movement, the Freemason movement is an un-Islamic movement. Those who participate and believe in their ideas and in their um, thoughts that they try to spread is a kafir. Now, to be part of the Freemason movement goes against Islam totally. Though they camouflage their movement with freedom and brotherhood, etc., it's a Zionist Jewish movement run by Zionists and, and Jews, and they would like to get all those in the world out of their religion, not to join them to be Jews or because this is a, a, a racist religion. Only Jews can be Jews, unlike Muslims. Anyone, black, white, red, yellow, uh, no matter what your ethnicity is, you just say la ilaha illallah and you become a Muslim. All people, all denominations are welcome. Oh, if you want, you just become a Muslim. So um, uh, joining such a movement is totally prohibited and against Islam. Now, if they give us food, is it permissible to eat? It's a long topic. The most authentic opinion is as long as it is not meat, because meat that they slaughter is not halal for us. So we do not accept that. But if it's vegetables or candies or whatever, and there is no affection, there's no love between us, so we're not appreciative and this is not a token of friendship, but they give us the food and we take it, no problem in doing that and accepting it, inshallah, providing it's not meat. A brother ask, is, he says that I'm all of a sudden so afraid of shaitan at night. This is from shaitan. Allah tells us in a number of places in the Quran that it's verily shaitan who wants to sadden you and he wants to depress you. So don't listen to him. Have your trust in Allah Azza wa Jal. Whenever you get these fear, uh, uh, intimidated uh, feelings and feelings of fear and, 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 and anxiety at night, look around you. Who created the whole universe? Who has everything in his hands? Who controls everything? It is Allah Azza wa Jal. And if you're a Muslim and you trust Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah is with you. So Allah is your protector. Allah is your provider. And whenever you get these feelings, recite Ayat al-Kursi, recite the last two verses of Surah al-Baqarah. And if you make ruqya on yourself and blow on zamzam or on normal water, drink of it, wash your face with it, believing that this will protect you with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal from any anxiety or fear with the grace of Allah, you are in good hands. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have. Until we meet next time, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah is my heart's speech. Your mercy is what I beseech.